Art Chat is made possible by the support of the Artistics Harmonies Association. Create your next aha experience with us. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Art Chat. My name is Linda Riesenberg Sissler, and I'm here as your host. And I'm also here with uh, a co podcast. Um, gosh, what are we, DJs? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure what we call ourselves, <laughs> moderators, um, all that kind of stuff. But anyway, Gail Holnick is with us. Uh, Gail is a former reporter and media marketing consultant. She's got a lot of things in her background. It's it's really uh, wonderful. Actually, I had a, um, we did a podcast exchange. So we'll talk a little bit about Gail's podcast here in a few minutes, but she's also a novelist author. Um, she's been a lifelong student, which is something that I think we both have in common. Uh, she's written travel memoirs. Uh, she runs a publishing company called Windward Group. She's also an honorary member of the Artistic Harmonies Association. And her podcast, again, is Brainwave. So welcome, Gail. Thank you, Linda. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me. Yeah, that, that was a fun podcast that we had. Doing this exchange is nice. Um, we got to know each other. And I thought, wow, you know, with Gail's background, she would be actually perfect to be on our honorary members list over at Artistic Harmonies as we start to get things rolling there. So especially with all of your background and part of the, you know, the, the goal of Artistic Harmonies is to provide folks with some business background. And so tell us a little bit more because you know, we in the green room, we were chatting on both podcast greens rooms <laughs> earlier about all of our experience, but um, our listeners haven't heard about that. So with this long list of accomplishments that you've done, um, tell us a little bit about yourself, a little bit more in detail. Well, thank you. Well, I, like so many uh, authors and uh, novelists that I've met while doing the Brainwave podcast over the past year, I got started when I was 10 or 11 years old. I mean, I, I knew, always knew I wanted to write and uh, started off as a very young perspective. I remember when we were in grade one in the school that I was in, I should say first grade. So grade one will give it away that I'm a Canadian. And I started <laughs> out there. I've been in the States for quite a few years now, but uh, back in elementary school, they had us in little rooms where there was a bathroom at the back of the room. Cause I think they didn't trust the five and six year olds to make it down the hall uh, <laughs> uh, with enough time so uh -huh. there's a bathroom in every one of the, the first grade classrooms and in that bathroom they had paper towels in the uh the dispenser and I would snitch sneak away with the paper towels take far more than I needed and fold them they folded into these lovely little folded things and I would write use my crayons and write stories on them so uh -huh. I'm all held on to those for years and years so I was always storytelling and I thought I would be a writer and then when I got to be a, and love books did then do now always will I got to be about whatever 19 or 20 and I got that question which I think so many artistic people get is well that's fine but how are you going to make a living with that <laughs> yes. how are you going to make a living and so I went off to journalism school and studied to be a journalist and spent 20 years plus um, working as a, a television reporter a television reporter I hosted a morning public radio uh, talk show three hours every morning covered the arts covered business politics current affairs sports even I did the, quite a few sports interviews and did that for a number of years so that was my my main thing in life but I was all the time uh, still writing away bits of novels bits of short stories here and there it was just a hobby pretty much really uh, and then then I went mothering which I like to think of it that way, but I, I had three and I decided that I wanted to be with them and I was given that support and I was able to be with them and took them through their early years. And then again, still writing stories in my spare time or four o'clock in the morning when somebody couldn't sleep or needed something or other to put them down in the crib and then write a few more pages, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. So I got to the, I, I uh, fast forwarding, I got to the age where I had the luxury of thinking, okay, I've, I've raised them we raise them what do i want to do now uh what could i do with my time and the writing the literary arts just kept coming up and, and coming up i should also mention but i did try to publish at various points along the way and this links to the brainwave podcast in that i had the idea when i was hosting uh the radio show i would meet people and one of my favorite questions was well, where did you get the idea for that award-winning mm -hmm. novel or painting or song interviewed a lot of musicians and there's just wonderful stories of how people came on that 
came to that creative moment, what I came to think of as the charmed moment. So I pitched a book about uh, the charmed moment and actually had a publisher lined up, had a contract and the publisher went bust. Oh no. So I, didn't, I didn't have a contract. Uh, so then that just got parked in some corner of my brain for 20 years or whatever. So when I decided I wanted to start doing a podcast again, or start doing a podcast, which was last year, I've been doing it just over a year. I remembered that book and that that foiled uh, ambition and project. And I thought that's of all the things that I could talk to people about uh, on this weekly podcast. That's what I'd like to do. Set all that up. It's called the Brainwave Podcast with Gail Holmick. And it's on all the, uh, because if you just, <laughs> if you just search <laughs> Brainwave, you get all kinds of neuroscientists, uh, which is a fascinating area of studying. <laughs> yes, I'm it is. Knocking it, but um, a, a lot of, uh, so it's, it's the Brainwave Podcast with Gail. And that's where that is. So, and the same, I'm doing the same thing as I was trying to do all those years ago in book form, which is meeting really interesting creatives and creators and asking them, where did that idea come from? Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's kind of interesting. It's, it's, our paths are kind of similar, um, which is probably why we hit it off so well. Uh, but it's it was, you know, you were talking about you were writing as a kid, and I was doing the same thing. I had these little steno books, you know, and I would I'd have a whole <laughs> script written uh, of my favorite TV shows at the time, like The Mod Squad, which is dating me, <laughs> and a number of other things. I recall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but it, yeah, so. I think while you were talking, I was sitting there thinking about how we strayed from what it is we really wanted to do to a make money, support the family, you know, have an have an income for retirement, all of those things. And and I think about my young friends, um, you know, in their twenties and thirties, and they just keep asking me for advice. And it's like, well, this is the stuff you do, so you can do the other stuff later which mm -hmm. I don't think is very good advice, but, but it is kind of the truth, isn't it? It's kind of- Well, I think you're right. And, but I also think there's just so much variability and in individual personality that goes mm -hmm. into that decision. So, um, and I, sometimes I, I admire it when I think of the person who's 22 or 25 years old and who says, I'm not going to college, I'm going to paint. That's what I do and I'm going to. And they, they're willing to embrace that life and that's the mm -hmm. right choice. So I think everybody makes the right choice for them. I was maybe a little bit too suggestible now when I think back of it <laughs> when I was 25. But then, you know, hindsight is 2020. How can I know? I, I, you know, maybe I would have enjoyed starving in a garret and maybe I would not. So. <laughs> that's true. That's true. So um, I want to share your website. Um, which is your name, D-A-I-L-H-U-L-N-I-C-K.com. And um, I, we were going to talk a little bit about your book. You have a couple different series. Yes. Um, where do you want to start? You want to start with the media series since that's up here? Yeah, yeah, that's up there. And that is where it started for me. So uh, the very first novel that I put out there, and I created Windward Group publishing and media, knowing that I wanted to go at it in a sort of a business-like kind of way. And should things go the right way, I also wanted to publish others as well. I've, I've learned, it's been an incredible learning journey over, over the years of, of how to do that and so on. But I started out with, uh, and it goes back 15 years or so, with a, a novel idea called The Lion's Share of the Airtime. And I thought, I, I want to do media mysteries. Every, we, we have legal thrillers. We have medical mysteries and thrillers. As these areas are well tapped. They're genres if you go looking for them on Kindle or, or Amazon or in your bookstore. Romance, you can find entire sections and so on. Where's the, where are the media mysteries? And of course, it, it's done, been done. And on television, I mean, there are plenty of movies about media environments and newspapers and so on. But anyway, I wanted to kind of collect this in this way. So the lion's share of the airtime is about uh, a television station. It's about a young woman reporter who's working in a TV station and one of her colleagues, the, the star investigative reporter of the newsroom, um, falls or is pushed or jumps from a high rise apartment balcony. And everyone assumes it's that he jumped. Mm -hmm. And she uh, doesn't believe it. It just doesn't feel right. And so she becomes the amateur sleuth in a way. She has a couple of police officer partners and so on. But she wants to find out the truth about this fellow's death. And that's the premise of the story. So that was the first one that I did. I got started on this. Um, and I might mention as well that another thing that I did once I had the time, when I was 58, I went back to school. 
Mm -hmm. I thought, and I had been on a track to do a BFA, uh, Bachelor of Fine Arts, when I was 18 or 19, uh, and uh, got that question, how are you going to make a living with that? And also ran into, this is one of my little messages of life, I guess, whatever, but I ran into a professor who deterred me from my path. And you had to submit a portfolio to be admitted to the creative writing program. And so I submitted my portfolio and received it back just drenched in red <laughs> blood. It already yeah, had my yeah. blood, sweat and tears in it. <laughs> but it was copy edited down to the level, down to it at the nth level. I think I have it still somewhere. But anyway, all of this <laughs> portfolio was just, it, it was me. It was just really cruel. Now, obviously, that was that teacher's view of the way to develop young people. Mm -hmm. uh, what he ran into with me was a, a, a somewhat soft and uh, easily deterred person. So I looked at this. So I looked at it and the, and the notes and the reports. I said, la, 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 you, know, la, la. you are admitted to the program. <laughs> and I thought, they're, they're letting me in. <laughs> After all that red? <laughs> After all that. Uh, but I didn't go. I was oh, just really? so, I was so put down and so hurt and all of that about that I en en enrolled instead in a BA and got, and in the end, I did a double major in psychology and sociology. So it just went in a completely different kind of way. And the BFA was just one of those bad experiences way back when. So not that fast, I guess, a long story. Fast forward <laughs> um, all these years. I was 58 and I had the opportunity to think of a new a left turn in my life. What do I want to do now? So I went back to school and I enrolled in MFA and qualified. This time my portfolio came back with a welcome, welcome, and we're looking forward to working with you and we will help you become a better writer, uh, which is what I was looking for. So I went back for two years. And at the same time, I did a lot of, you have to, you had to, it was really an interesting program. It's University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada, and large parts of it, I'd say 80 or 90% of it is uh, online. So we were there and met fellow students and sort of did a summer program for weeks, I guess. And then away you go by yourself and we would log on and do look at work. It was all Iowa workshop method. So look at people's work and, and workshop and so on. So, and you also had to do so my thing is novels, but you had to do two other, uh, they call them genres, but areas of specialty. So I also did screenwriting and I also did uh, creative nonfiction. And uh, so I did all of the coursework that was required, but at the same time I was working away in the lion's share of the airtime. So, and kind of teaching myself self-publishing on the side as I did that. Mm -hmm. So once uh, I was finished the program and then about a year later, I brought out the lion's share of the airtime. They're a series, so I'm actually working on, just finished book four. So book two is A Bird in the Sand. Book three is Sleeping Dogs Lie. Also, there will be six of them so far in my idea. All six of them have a, a, an animal, a saying of some kind in the title to kind of bind them all together. And they all um, have three, there are three women who, whose stories run through all six books in different stages of life. So Shalane is in her mid twenties, Nevada is in her mid forties and Lillian is in her mid sixties and their paths cross and each one of them um, is at the head of the, the parade a different one is at the head of the parade in each of the three books. So those are the three. And then Sleeping Dogs Lie just came out this past January, January of 2022. And I finished a first draft of Kangaroo Court, which is going to be out sometime this summer or fall. And that's the fourth one. Okay. Wow. Great. So one of the things when, when I noticed your use of media mysteries and naturally your background in media and it always comes up with like the first rule I think I was taught when I was, you know, studying um, writing was, you know, only write what you know. Like, don't try to write what you don't know. Of course, I always like to break the rules. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was not a spy in a previous life. So, <laughs> but uh, do like those spy mysteries and, and things like that. So do have some background there. But this sounds really fascinating. And um, I was, I'm thinking... I, when I was over on your Amazon author page, I think I saw Lillian's name more. Is she more like your main character or are the three women sort of the three protagonists of the, the story? Really three protagonists. So in, in uh, Lion's Share of the Airtime, Shalan Montgomery is the young reporter who does the investigating. Nevada is her boss as a, 
a news director in the TV newsroom, and Lillian is an older woman that they encounter on the streets. Cool. Uh, and the, but then when we move into the second book, which is A Bird in the Sand, it focuses on a different medium. So it's not TV news anymore, it's movies. And it focuses on a different one of the women. So it's Nevada, happens to be uh, taking a leave of absence from her news director job, and she's in Savannah, Georgia. And she's on the fringes of a movie production for various reasons where um, a, a very valuable or priceless really prop disappears mm. and she tries to find. So they're not all, another thing is they're not all murder mysteries. So the first one was a murder mystery. The second one is a theft mystery, I guess. Oh, okay. And then the third one, which is Lillian, uh, who's taking the lead and she's in her I've, I'm doing that math all the time makes it interesting. But anyway, she's in her early 70s by this point, I guess, because they move along in time. Um, she's working for a community newspaper in Florida. And so we've moved from TV to movies to newspapers. Mm -hmm. uh, and she becomes involved in investigating a killing there. And okay. then the fourth one, which is yet to come, is back to Chelan again. And it's social media. So there's a, a crime that oh. takes place in social media. So wow, cool, real current. So that, that's great. So well, let's move on to the resorting series, which I thought was interesting because some of this is based on the travel you did when you were a reporter. Is that correct? Mm, uh, well, in part because each one of them uh, is set at a resort. Okay. And I did uh, a certain amount of traveling when I was working in media, um, but even more so after I was in media, I was a I was an am a media consultant. So working with my husband, who has a marketing consulting firm, we do uh, consulting mostly in the architecture and engineering fields to firms that want to um, work on their marketing, marketing skills and so on. And media is a slice of that. So, so whenever there's a call for someone to come and work with people who have to do interviews and so on, I come in and, and do that sort of thing. So through that work, we did a lot of travel and uh, you know how companies are and organizations are and they have their annual meeting and it's in the such and such resort of in Colorado Springs or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting in these places and, and do my bit and so on. And then I'm just passing the time and working on my novels. And I thought I could make a series out of all of this. Now it's not a series in the sense that it's the same characters running through it. They're all slightly different and different things happen. But what binds them together is they're all in a resort of some kind and there's some kind of, of conflict or action. So the first one is set in the Caribbean and it's called Resorting to Murder. And it's about a group of chefs who turn up on St. Croix, which is one of the US Virgin Islands, uh, for a competition. They're doing a, an Iron Chef style thing, but not on TV, but for real in this, in this resort. And various crimes take place. And, and our, our hero, uh, who was a young employee at the resort, goes to work trying to solve the, the, cry, the murder, supposed murder. Then the second one is called Resorting to Larceny, and it's set in the world of cars. And so it's, it's a, a group of three couples who want to go in a car rally, and they find the entry fees just incredibly stiff. And they think, we're not doing that. We have to buy groceries or gasoline for our cars these days. So instead, they invent their own, and they organize their own car rally. And then as this car rally is taking place, and this one happens in Georgia and South Carolina, uh, it, and a bit of Florida, um, as the car rally is underway, uh, various crimes take place and they go to work on solving them. And then the third and final one of the novels, I haven't returned to this as far as no novel goes, is called Resorting to Fraud. And it's set in a number of places around the world, but the, the main character is a rock star who is of a certain age. It's a later in life uh, mm -hmm. mystery. He's of a certain age. He hates his life. I mean, we, we would all envy it and think he's, he, you know, has it made in the shade as the Rolling Stones would say since his thirties, but in fact, he hates it and he wants a way out. And so he comes up with a, a, a there's a rather unusual way out here that then um, gets, uh, the fraud gets discovered. I'll go as far as that. So that one was a lot of fun to do. And then finally what I did, and I, I think, I don't know if you're like this as a writer as well, Linda, but I have a lot of ideas, fragments of ideas written in, in books here and there that the notebooks that turn into short stories, it's sort of like, I don't, this is not got the, the steam to be a full novel, but I do want to write it. 
I've got 10 pages here. So I have, and it's called Resorting to Short Stories. And it's just, I think I've forgotten how many it is, but 25 or 30 of them. And it's the collection of, of stories um, that I didn't, didn't turn into entire novels. So Great. mostly mysteries, although there's a, there's a paranormal in there, there's a romance in there. So just everything I wanted to try. Right. Wonderful. Um, it was really, when I write, I typically write, and I want to compare it to your writing style if we can. Um, I typically write in, in scenes. So, um, you know, this one starts out in Washington, D.C. We're in the Oval Office, and then it goes into the scene. So, you know, these almost like script writing, because that's what I studied more was script writing, but I, it is mm -hmm. more um, you know, on a novel base and I'd scene by scene by scene. So this takes place in the Oval Office uh, of the White House. The next place may be the UK Embassy in Moscow and then the next place. So, you know, maybe Paris, France or, or something. And that's all in one book. So when I'm writing, I'm typically seeing scenes and writing scenes. And I think I told you this on um, your podcast, you know, if I get up to 350,000 words, just in my pants or sit down and start writing thing, you know, that's not the book. I have to go back and, and start to, you know, create that build up and, and to that, you know, key point that happens. How come my writing mind is not working very well today? <laughs> but, um, but yeah, you know, you, you have your midpoint, your center point, you know, all of the different places. So um, how does that compare to what you do when you're writing? How do you, do you pants it or do you outline it? Do you, you know, do you just start writing a bunch of stories like your short stories and say, hey, this would be cool to plug this in here and change the names around? Take us through your process a little bit. Well, I'm much more of a plotter than a pantser. Okay. Uh, and I, almost from the beginning, when I get the beginning of the idea, uh, I think the second, the next step for me is, is this is a series of questions to myself, but is this something that I think has legs and that would carry a 300, 400 page book, a full novel? Is, are they, am I interested enough in the characters? Is there enough going to be happening subplot wise? Is there enough happening theme wise and, and takeaways and, and lessons learned and all of that kind of thing, which always sounds so uh, teacherish, but you know what I mean. You don't mm -hmm. want to start reading on page one and by page 400, the character is still exactly the same, the main <laughs> character. It needs to be changed. Right. So I think all that through sort of pretty carefully before I get started with words uh, and who's the character and this and that and have all that sorted um, before I sit down, but I, well, there's a new word. I don't know how new it is, but anyway, it's new to me. I just came across it a few months ago, plant sir. So a kind of a combination between a plotter and a pantser. So I do that plotting and that outlining. Um, I do a really detailed outline of about 54 to 60 scenes. Mm -hmm. And I know what's going to happen at each point along the way and where the climax is going to come. And then I revise that. I usually get to about version eight of mm -hmm. the outline by the time I'm finished. Uh, but I also try to make sure that I have elbow room for the pantsing part, because even though it's outlined that carefully and the, and the scene and so on, I want to sit down and for an hour and a half, two hours, four hours, however long it takes, but just kind of lose myself in, in the movie. I mean, it's, a, it's mm -hmm. like doing a movie in your mind, really, isn't mm -hmm. it? And you're a fly yes, on is. the wall. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just watching these characters do their thing and, and taking notes as fast as I can. So that's the pantser part. Um, and I, I chuckle at what you say about then I have 350,000 words. I don't think I've ever done quite that well. My flow has never been quite that good, but writing is rewriting. I mean, you yeah. have to, even with an outline and, and so on, you have to come back to it later and say, okay, now what do I do with this? Uh, yeah, exactly. Of yeah, exactly. Sorry. Um, one of the, the things that I'm paying right now in book five is, um, if I had, actually taken time to plot out and outline and everything else, I wouldn't be in this never ending edit cycle <laughs> <laughs> to try to get the structure there that I'm looking for that I know has to be there. So you're, you're going to pay that time one way or another. If you're a pantser and you just like to write things, you know, and, and writing just kind of flows from what you're seeing in your mind, that's all well and fine, but nobody ever publishes that I know of that rambling on 
manuscript <laughs> no, no. Uh, of being a pantser. I mean, we turn around then and have to put that structure back in there. Otherwise, you know, it, it's not going to sell. It's just, you know, it's that's just not. right. So, so you pay for it one way or another. And as I, I get into book five, I'm sitting there really like starting to admonish myself and saying, you really need to start thinking about plot here. This is book five, you know, you can't just <laughs> rattle it off of the top of your head. But, um, it, you know, we, we all have to get to our characters. We all have to know where we want our characters to go. Um, there's always a question in my mind. Now, if I do this, am I going to lose readers and do I care? <laughs> you know, why? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, sometimes there's this side of people that we don't know um, that they're very good at hiding. And uh, one of my probably, my readers think of it as my, their favorite person. You know, they, they have all the, the great looking guys, actors that are in, you know, in their mind. It's like, oh, okay, you know, Aiden Turner is going to play Sean and, <laughs> And I'm yes. just as bad. I do that too. But, but, you know, they're, they're like, they're really rooting for Sean and, you know, Sean has never in my mind, this is going to give away some stuff, but he's never been this perfect guy that everybody thinks he is. Um, so that's starting to come out in book five. And, and, and with your series, I wonder if you, you know, have a, a character that is through out these whole books including and we'll get to your rumble strip series too and you could plug that in and talk about that if you want are there times when you just say you know this this person is just too vanilla in here this character i need to spice them up some and you know really start to tweak the readers way they feel about that just to kind of you know keep the interest there i guess I do. And I hope it's happening. I hope it works. I don't know about spice it up yet. Uh, uh, <laughs> although that's sort of, you know, maybe eventually, but for example, in the media mysteries, Shalan, when she starts out in book one is 25 years old and is, is trying to, in addition to trying to solve the murder mystery, she's trying to sort out her own life in terms of her, her relationships, both with her family and her uh, boyfriend. Uh, by, and then we hear a little bit more about her in book two and book three, and now she's center stage again in book four, and she's a young mother. So I don't know how spicy that is, but anyway, <laughs> she's, she's trying to deal with all the, the things to do with how, you know, do I, can I still have a career? How do I balance my, my obligations and my love for these toddlers and infants with the other part of my personality and, and, and who I am? Right. So that's kind of what's happening with her. And, she, and she's developed that way from book one to book four. And same thing with the other two. So there is some change and some new challenges thrown at each of them. I, I do relate to what you say about which actor, because I think, and I think you're probably the same, but I'm a visual person person as well as a word person mm -hmm. and uh, as I get started on any one of these novels and this is something that's come across I've heard from some of the other novelists that I've interviewed for the Brainwave podcast is you know how how do you handle things and how do you do things um, to get that visual image of a character uh, one of the tips that I heard that I thought was brilliant and I'm now using all the time is uh, I have used the actors the movie actors one <laughs> but I go online and I just scroll around uh, looking at people um, in whatever occupation or whatever and then I get a, an image of this this could be and would be Chelan mm -hmm. and it's and especially also you really have to work with days so one of the ones I've worked on is not out yet but is a flashback to 1964 and it's, which was a year when just so many amazing things happened, everything from Olympics to the Beatles to uh, civil rights issues and so on, it was an amazing year. So, but as I'm writing that, I've got my, my image of my five or six main characters that I've snapped from the internet here and there, uh, making sure that they're 1964 people and not mm -hmm. 2019 people because they looked a certain way at that time. So I get that visual image. The other thing I do a lot is I'm also a photographer and I um, spend a lot, I've got a lot of my own photography is in the Rumble Strip series that I've done travel books. Um, I spent a lot of time photographing. So when I start something, I need to have a visual on the setting. Mm -hmm. So, and again, flipping back to what you were saying earlier about writing what you know, we all know what the Oval Office looks like. I mean, right. We have a visual on it. I've never actually been there. And there's my pitch. Somebody wants to invite me. I'd love to go. <laughs> uh, but I've never actually been there. But I, I have an image of it. And the same with these places that I create. If there's going to be... Um, say with Kangaroo Court, it's in uh, a suburb in Central California. 
uh, somewhere near Santa Rosa, but not quite. I need to look at photographs and, and have a sense of, of that setting. So that's part of what I do as well when I'm really getting started with something and really getting into something is I will go and uh, I haven't been to Santa Rosa yet, but go into a place, um, the one in Vancouver, lion's share of the airtime, all of the settings I photographed and studied and you know days when it's pouring rain and you can't get out to the location I could look at those pictures and I find that visual really helps with this part of the process right yeah I mean I remember when I was researching some of the stuff for my books you know I was like okay this happens in an alley behind the um air and space museum Smithsonian Air and Space Museum and I'm still going wait, is there an alley back there? So the next thing I know, I'm like, yeah. you know, I'm out on the internet looking at Google Maps to see if there is an alley back there. And I'm sort of thinking, you know, if this is Hollywood, they just make it, a, they, they don't care. They just, yes. okay, this is, an al- this is an alley. We'll just say it's back there. You know, it's not a big deal, but it's like, I know there's going to be somebody out there that lives in Washington, D.C. and says something like, there's not an alley behind that, you know? <laughs> and then you lose, credibi- you lose credibility. So you have to, you know, there's so much research that goes on. Even if you're a pantser, there's so much research that goes on to make sure that you're making that place real. Sometimes I think writing fantasy should be easier, but I don't know if I'm that creative to <laughs> you know, create a whole world like Tolkien did and, and everybody, but yeah, so, so that's great. So the Rumble series, you have five in this series. Just yes. Quickly. So go ahead. Yes. And this one started out with in 2017. So it's five years ago now, I guess. But my husband and I are both um, expat Canadians living in the States for a long time. And it, Canada celebrated 150 years. So it's a much younger country than the States. Uh, but we wanted to do some kind of project and we'd never driven across it. We're both big road trip fans and we'd never done that. And so we decided to drive all the way across from, we drove from, we were living in Savannah at the time. So from Savannah up to Newfoundland and kind of like stuck our toe in the water. And okay, now we're at the farthest Eastern corner of this country. And we drove through Newfoundland, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia, into Quebec. I'll list them all here, (laughs) all the provinces, all the way out to Victoria, which is Vancouver Island, which is the farthest Western point. And then I thought, uh, I, I'm just this way, but I, I keep track, I document and so on. I've done so many things. Um, I didn't blog at that time, 20, I wasn't into blogging or um, posting on Instagram or anything like that. I want to do a book. So that's where the first Rumble Strip book came in. It's Rumble Strip Canada 150. And since then, I've done Rumble Strip USA off the interstate, and it's a collection of all of 25. Um, trips that we've taken off the interstate into various states. So it it hits on 25 of the states. I'm still working on the next 25 and I'm collecting notes. So they're long-term projects. And then we had two that we did in Europe. We were, we went to Europe on a trip and thought, could we love so many of the places, but every, every place we'd be sitting having a, a latte, I'd be saying, I could live here. I think I could live here. So could we live here is the, the theme of that book. Uh, and we we looked at, and it's not all of Europe, so it's France and Switzerland and Italy. Uh, and then we went to the Benelux countries, which Bel- Belgium, the Netherlands and Luxembourg. Uh, and I did a book about that as well. And then the fifth one in the series was kind of a whole different turn. This was my COVID uh, project. It wasn't traveling or anything. And so I interviewed 35 other travelers some of them were just travelers people who had a story to tell about a trip they'd taken some of them are travel bloggers uh and they they are writers as well and it's called rumble strip world voices from the road and this also this is interesting is to keep up with technology is is fun Uh, but at that time transcription wasn't as widely available as, as it is now so on our podcast now of course you can um uh, arrange with a service or whatever and have a whole transcription of your podcast right there on your um, podcast site. But at this time, which was 2020, it was only two years ago, but uh, whether it was available and I didn't know about it or I didn't have the funds and didn't want to do it. Anyway, I transcribed all these interviews manually. And so I would talk to people for an hour or so, and then I would sit down and they're there. It's, so it's a collection of interviews with all the people, the transcriptions of the interviews, some of my thoughts about each of the places that they had been, 
Uh, lots of quotes about famous quotes and some not so famous, but um, like uh, I think it's John Muir who wrote, not, not all who wander are lost, mm -hmm. those kinds of, of travel quotes and pulled it all together. And it, 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 I, it stands up for me anyway, I've gone back and especially in the midst of 40 days of not seeing anybody except whoever uh in, in my husband but i mean not getting out of the, the home that much uh, i go back and read them and they africa alaska thailand uh the netherlands spain italy it was just a wonderful sort of armchair traveler kind of thing to do so that was right. the the fifth one of rumble strip cool so uh, again, you can go out to Gail's website. You can order these off of Amazon, all these wonderful stories. <laughs> so um, I'm going to stop the share here and come back to us. Here we are. And yeah, so thank you for sharing all of the, the books. But you know, one of, the, of our commonalities, if you will, is talking about creativity uh, with our podcast. So what I wanted to do was just kind of um, let you talk about some of the interesting discoveries you've had on Brainwave and, and what you find fascinating about talking with the people who are creatives. Yes, we, we definitely do have that in common and, and you have been done it, doing it for such a long time. I was really impressed with Art Chat and the people oh, that you've you. met over the years and, and that. Uh, I, I really like the idea of what we can learn from one another as creative so uh, and and there is a time and a place for specialization and uh niching down as they put it and so on but i also think that just the commonalities that we have what a painter knows about the creative moment the creative process uh the working life of an artist has so many similarities to what a songwriter goes through or what a filmmaker has as part of their both daily life and and bird's eye view big picture life and i wanted to do a podcast that that had people from all of those walks of life and defining uh, the creative professional as a, a fairly loose kind of category. So I have choreographers and uh, chefs, uh, everything that's creative. And it's been interesting, I don't know if you found this as well, Linda, but in defining, because creativity impl is, it implies a lot of different things. I mean, you can be creative about the way that you raise a two-year-old, mm -hmm. you know, and how you solve the, the, the two-year-old tantrum problem or whatever. There's creativity, <laughs> there's creativity in the way that you fix a plumbing issue. Mm -hmm. But I, what I'm getting at is the person who uh, either is or aspires to be a creative professional. Mm -hmm. and uh, what commonalities there are there and starting from the jumping off point of uh, how did you get the idea for whatever it is and then the conversation rambles and winds around and I, I very much try to bounce from what the person is telling me but ending up at a point of of learning mm -hmm. so if you're and many of the people that I talk to have been doing it for 30 40 50 years some very new ones actually I interviewed a glass blower uh, from California a couple of months ago, who's in his maybe late twenties, and so a new, you know, newer thoughts. Um, but what have you asking all of them, regardless of how long they've been doing it? Uh, what have you learned, and what can you, what do you wish you knew then that you know now? And so that's the format that I go at with it all, and and you know, they're, they're, again with both the tips at the end and the how did you get the idea? There are some really interesting commonalities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, I, I guess, I can't remember exactly what I answered when you asked me that question about learning at the end, but I, what I, what hit me when you did say that at this point was, it is a lifelong journey of learning. I mean, I can learn something now that I'm years old. <laughs> It's just a number. <laughs> it's just a number. Yeah. I, I feel like I'm 18 until I go hiking and then I feel like I'm in my sixties. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's this don't get stuck in that whole, you know, I have to paint this way or I have to write this way. You know, I want to write like this person. I want to paint like this person. Those folks have already been here. They've already done it. Find, find your, and it's going to take you a while to do that. That's the journey of finding your voice um, and to stick with that. So um, I think both of us are examples of you can do this all your life and um, enjoy it and continue to learn. And it's just a, a fascinating 
life to live when you're in that creative spirit and wanting to, you know, all the business stuff, the business world is the business world. And then there's this creative world where we can get creative about the business world, but we can also get creative with our own journey and what it is that we're trying to create and always asking yourself, what is it that we're trying to create? What is that voice that we're trying to find? So I, I think one of the things that it came, has come through the various people that I've talked to about the business side uh, is, and, and it goes with the creative side as well, but the business mm -hmm. side, especially uh, persistence and mm -hmm. that you never give up. And I, uh, I talked with, I don't know if you remember this from the nineties, but there was a group called tag team and they did one of the very first hip hop numbers. And it was, whoop, there it is. Whoop, mm -hmm. there it is. <laughs> so DC Glenn was the writer of that piece uh is one half of tag team and a person who's he's one of my episodes and has had a, a lifelong career um in various forms of creativity uh and then that song i don't know if you if you're a football watcher but that song turned up on on football commercial it was geico i think and geico was using it to sell geico but also they're doing ice cream mm -hmm. so it's scoop there it is now right. that's morphed into so yeah. and one of the things that themes that came through in his interview was first off persistence and mm -hmm. never give up on anything but also it's just like and it's i think part of the, the wonder of a creative career you mm -hmm. never know what's around the corner because i never would have dreamed that this was going to happen 20 however whatever do the math i can't uh 20 <laughs> 25 years later uh with that little song that that turned up way back when um and that people would still enjoy the rhythm of it and all of that and that it be for ice cream i mean it's it, life is endlessly fascinating who would have thought queen would have been singing we are the champions for the super bowl <laughs> and different <laughs> things i mean you know they yeah. probably didn't have that in mind at all so when they did that but yeah, yeah. absolutely um yeah, something that you may have written when you were younger, um, you know, go back and visit it. Maybe you can be updated, put in. I mean, yeah, never, never stop looking at that and never stop learning. I think the learning piece is just so important and um, needs to, to be emphasized, I think, in, in today's world is, you know, just because you graduate from high school, college, whatever, um, doesn't mean that that's the end of your learning life. We learn so much on our journey. Um, not wanting to feel too philosophical or, or looking back as hindsight, but uh, yeah, it's your life is exciting because you're learning new things. And if you stop that, you kind of get stuck and it's just kind of not as much fun. <laughs> so. You do, you do. I mean, I, I um, enjoy people who continue to learn so much and I've, we've run across all kinds of them, but I remember hearing someone say a number of years ago, well, I, there's such an avalanche of apps and things that we can do technically and so on and and this one person said in a very grumpy way i don't want to learn anything more <laughs> I, I can just show you this i'm done learning i'm just up to here i don't want to learn another thing and that's a shame because right. you know there's constant improvement and there's so much to learn that you need to keep going with it you know and i think um to the the tips but by the way i should mention in our our interview um your you the things that you had to say it ran throughout the entire 45 minutes with, with oh. <laughs> it, was, it was learning and teaching throughout so it was just a, a, a wonderful um plethora of that um I, I, uh -oh. I, two part I series <laughs> <laughs> it might be actually it was a really really Aww. good long interview but Very i sweet. think one of the things that you said and, and and i has i've heard from others as well and comes through and i think is so important if you're a young person listening to this um we are all, in most cases we are our own worst critic mm -hmm. and uh with novels you find yourself looking at something and you and then you read something that you know delia owens or chris Hanna or whoever james patterson whoever your um, anthony door mentioning all my favorites <laughs> um as is done you can't compare yourself to the person you shouldn't you the shouldn't. person who's on stage at carnegie hall i mean that's the pinnacle and you don't know what they went through to get there or how they analyze and self-criticize themselves mm -hmm. so you have to just stay in your own heart in your own head in your own soul about i'm doing the best i can do i'm not giving up uh and and enjoy yourself that's the other thing i think a lot of creative people um at a certain they're, they're so you know tied up twisted up and I say, like where's the fun mm -hmm. well, find the fun in it otherwise don't do it right absolutely great advice great advice i've been watching i for some reason, F. Scott Fitzgerald has started to 
interests me more and more. And it's not that I've sat down and read all of F. Scott Fitzgerald's work. I mean, I've read The Great Gatsby. Um, I know about his other work. Um, he was never really a favorite of mine, but um, I've been watching, I watched Zelda, which is a million seen that, yes. yeah. yeah, and yeah. and it's like, oh, wow, she was here. She, she, the mental institution that she was in was here in Asheville, was in, you know, so, so F. Scott Fitzgerald has a, a tie to it, just like Carl Sandburg and Tom Wolf or, um, yeah, Tom Wolf. And uh, anyway, so I was like, you know, okay, so check this guy out. And it's just really, really sad because we all know that Zelda had mental issues mm -hmm. and he ended up institutionalizing her. And then he went out to Hollywood, went out to California and started writing. And to watch his life fall apart at the, you know, in the same time period that Zelda's was falling apart. It's just, it was really very sad to see that. And of course, those, um, one book, the one film that I saw recently was about his, his book, The Last Tycoon. And um, there's, a, I, I'm, I don't know how true it is. I have not gone back and researched it, but um, his assistant that he hired ends up finishing the book for him because he's in mm. such a, a bad way. Um, alcoholism and um, seeing Zelda and in the house and um it was it, it was an interesting point of view movie about of scott fitzgerald and then seeing him in uh other miniseries or whatever uh of the actor you know it's all of a sudden f scott fitzgerald takes on this whole different perspective um from me and and what i know about him and it's like well maybe i need to go back and read those other books by him to see, you know, now knowing where that's coming from, because I mean, it's the same way as like, if you don't know anything about Hemingway, then his whole writing style and, you know, the stories that he told may not be impressive. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, in Steinbeck and, and, and um, I mean, we could go on and on and on, but learning a little bit about the author, I think is important as well. So thank you so much for joining us, Gail. Um, if you have any other pieces of advice or anything you want to say now's the time to do that because we're going to get ready to close out the uh, podcast here well linda thank you so much for inviting me and and just to uh just to pick up briefly on on what you were saying about uh scott Fitzgerald and ernest hemingway i had a chance i went i love literary travel is another i have many I, so there's another series right there so i like <laughs> I have many many series i should finish the ones i'm working on but literary travel is another interest of mine and we visited ernest, ernest hemingway's home in key west yes. uh, about a month ago so my, and i decided to do it as a brainwave podcast episode so the episode for july 3rd is uh me standing there looking at his studio and his typewriter and saying okay wash over me <laughs> give me some of your 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 brilliance and your talent and your yep. creative insight but uh, I think being as you say watching and learning more about uh, artists from their um, their experience and things like biographies yeah. but also standing in and walking in their footsteps and standing in the spot where they work uh, is something that's very appealing. And I'm hoping to um, introduce more and more into the Brainwave podcast as the months go by. Oh, great. That sounds great. And I have actually a couple places here in Western North Carolina that I need to go visit of writers and um, stand in their place because it does inspire you. I've done that as an artist, as a, a painter, um, have not done that as an author. So that's a, an upcoming adventure for me to, to do that. So Anyway, thank you so much, Gail. I appreciate um, that you came on my podcast and that we exchanged uh, in the podcast. So check Gail out with her uh, Brainwave podcast. It's on all the major Brainwave outlets, Apple, and that's Windward Group too. Is that correct? Yes, there's another yeah. website that is windwardgroup.com which pulls together all of the, the, and the Brainwave podcast page is there as well uh and all of the things that are going on so that's a that's another good spot to to check out okay so thanks again and um we'll talk to you next time hopefully you know keep in touch because as being an honorable member of artistic harmonies any insight that you want to send our way we would love to have um and there's there'll be an update on what's going on with artistic harmonies here in a few minutes but just wanted to let gail go so she can go and enjoy her time and um Canada. So she's up in Canada right now visiting friends and family. And um, so it was so good to talk to you and see you again. Take care and we'll catch you um, on your Brainwave podcast.
Thank you, Linda. We'll keep in touch. Okay, sounds good. Bye now. Bye bye. What a wonderful guest. Uh, I hope you will take time to check out Gal Holmick and uh, her websites. And but I just wanted to very quickly bring you up to date with some of the activities going on at Autistic Harmonies Association. Um, as you can see, we have the board member selection meeting that will be coming up shortly. We will be sending out invitations for uh, different folks to join our board. Um, at that time, we will, after we have all of the acceptance, uh, we will actually have a blog written about it and may even bring some of them on our chat so that you can get to know our board members. We will be scheduling a Zoom chat create and cocktails time. Um, I think one of the things we would love to do is uh, kind of have us painting and writing or different things and um, having conversation around that and invite you into our uh, work areas and um, ask questions and participate and just you know have a good time with a cocktail or two. And we are also starting our investor fundraising activities. There'll be more coming up on that as well. Our next art chat is with Karen Espinot, and Karen is a independent movie producer. And she will be talking about her work and some of the differences between being an independent movie producer versus being a you know, Hollywood movie producer, how those are different. And we'll be talking about the actual fine art of creating movies itself. So uh, that recording session is on Thursday, June 23rd, and shortly after that, we will have Karen's chat out there as well. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I hope you found today's chat interesting and we look forward to our next podcast, which we'll be recording on June 23rd with Karen. Take care, everyone. See you later. Bye. Art Chat is made possible by the support of the Artistic Harmonies Association. Create your next aha experience with us.